Good morning. I'm Graham Bradby, the minister at Blackburn Presbyterian Church, welcoming you at the door, as it were. We, uh, we've been asked just to start a couple of minutes early to go live so that uh, several people will find it easier to log on to the Facebook page, our live stream. So if you're here already, uh, congratulations. The service itself won't begin uh, for another minute and a half, but I'm trusting that you'll find your way to this spot and uh, enjoy the service with us. Ordinarily, I would uh, be talking to a few people in the church and saying hello and welcome. Uh, and so I'm welcoming you, and I hope that you enjoy this uh, short time together. It's a modified service, and I'll remark about comments relating to that once the service gets underway. One of the amazing consequences of the period of uh, lockdown, as it's been called, is that uh, churches have been streaming services and we now have an amazing array of options. And we've been hearing about uh, people tuning into several different services and enjoying different aspects of the churches. And I'm sure that some of you will be doing that as well. So uh, also the, the steep learning curve that we've been on has brought us all the way through uh, Zoom options, which uh, we have a number of meetings with. A few weeks back, I screened uh, a Zoom greeting from 17 of the uh, church leaders in Blackburn, the White Horse area in which we, in which we meet. Um, and uh, it's great to know that we can network and keep together and actually try to continue the work of God in this place, in White Horse, our city. So it's now 11 o'clock and I'd like to invite you to join us. Uh, a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church. Thank you for tuning in. Since February the 2nd, we've been reflecting on Jesus' words in this place on the Sermon on the Mount. Back then, Groundhog Day, we had no idea about the impact of COVID-19 and what that would mean for us. And I'm grateful to numerous people, some of whom I mentioned last week, who have made suggestions and assisted us getting online. This is our eighth Sunday live streaming elements of our usual service. You can find a PDF of our regular Sunday leaflet, which we normally hand out at the door, uh, on the church webpage, blackburnpc.org.au. And... Uh, you can also find, find uh, previous studies, uh, previous leaflets there, and previous streamed services. So please uh, be sure to make yourself familiar with blackburnpc.org.au. It's a work in progress, and I'm very grateful to Ken Margo for the work he does on it each week. You'll be aware that the absence of music is a disadvantage to us. Singing has been a part of the Christian church worldwide and uh, if you were to look at the number of popular singers who began their careers in church or church choirs uh, you would be quite astonished I'm sure but unfortunately uh, when I screened Andre Bocelli singing Amazing Grace uh, in front of uh, Milan Cathedral a few weeks back I got a little note from Facebook saying that they had muted two minutes and 20 seconds of our service so I've been alerted to who owns what. I thought Amazing Grace, since it was in our songbooks, uh, might be access acceptable, uh, especially since he said it was a time of worship, not a concert. But I presume somebody else owned the music, and so uh, we were wrapped over the knuckles for that. So I need some careful guidance about how to bring music into this component of our service, and there'll be one or two changes, I'm sure, in the future as we seek to do that. We'd like you to leave comments to let us know you visited. And if you have any questions or reflections, please use the Facebook comments option. This week, I particularly want to thank Melinda Clark. She is the creator and CEO of the Melbourne Map. Uh, she has given us permission to use uh, her map on the, the cover of our leaflet, and I'm grateful to her for that. I'll tell you more about the Melbourne Map as our service proceeds. Her creative team have put together a jigsaw puzzle of the world's most livable city. 
No prizes for guessing which city that is. If you're viewing from another city, you'll discover. So today I invite you to join in the worship of God, connected through the internet as we are. And as we pray, we will listen to the Holy Scriptures, we'll reflect on them together, and we'll seek to pursue a vision of another city, as described in the Bible, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What does that mean? And un another city unfolded in the ministry and teaching of Jesus Christ. So let us begin with prayer. Let us unite our hearts and pray. Almighty and everlasting creator God, we recognize in brooding over the waters like a great mother bird that in the wonder of your being, you transcend gender and are beyond personality, yet you have created us in your image, both personal and gendered creatures. As we seek to draw close to you today, we want to thank you for the joy that children bring to our lives. And thank you for the mothers who have loved and nurtured us, for the mothers of our children, grandchildren, and for some uh, usually gathered with us here, the mothers of their great-grandchildren. We remember too that mothers have died and left us a legacy which has enriched us as we look back and rekindle memories through photographs and various things that remind us of them. We think of relatives and friends who have loved and cared for us and our children since they were born, that nurturing process. We remember those who have experienced the peculiar grief of losing their children, for mothers who have been bereaved, or perhaps children born with disability. We remember them before you. And we come to you, O God, with our own spiritual disability, seeking healing and the strength of your presence in our lives, that we might care as you do for your creation. Please use this short time together to that end, and we will seek to give you the glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, one of the components of our usual service is what we've called Young at Heart. And a couple of times in this series I've been struck by sayings that have come into the English language which have come out of the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to bring a few to you just now, just for you to consider. Uh, for example, a few sayings you might have heard somewhere along the line. Turn the other cheek. Have you heard that? If not, we need to think about that, what it means. What about an eye for an eye? Ah, well, that's a hard saying. It's often disparaged, but it means something about justice and fairness and equity. What about the salt of the earth? Have you ever heard somebody described as the salt of the earth? Someone that's uh, good for society, an advantage to have them around. Uh, somebody who benefits us all. Quite the opposite of a wolf in sheep's clothing. It seems to remind me of uh, Shaun the Sheep for some reason, although I'm not sure there have been wolves in Shaun the Sheep stories. But the idea that somebody can pretend to be other than they are and be a danger, a threat to us. Let your light shine. There's a lot of songs about letting your light shine. What about the straight and narrow it's a sort of constriction that we're invited to think about. We'll come back to that. Consider the birds of the air. I was talking to a man in his 90s this week, and one of his chief pastimes during this lockdown has been watching the birds in his garden that he feeds. Consider the birds of the air. Go the extra mile. I know we work in kilometers now, but some of the old timers you know might talk about the extra mile. Uh, Giving more than you've been asked to give. A commitment over and above. You cannot serve God and mammon. Well, the word mammon, of course, means wealth or money. And it's a familiar saying. And uh, it suggests that we tend to slop, slip into one particular uh, channel. Serving wealth and building wealth. 
Where your treasure is, is the beginning of a saying that we're possibly familiar with. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Or pearls before swine. Now, here's a bunch of sayings. They all come from the Sermon on the Mount. The teaching of Jesus is the source of all these sayings, which have come into the English language and provided ideas for us about the way society could be and should be. I want to take just this one, this last one, Pearls Before Swine. You'll hear it referred to in the reading, which Christine will bring to us uh, directly. But what does this mean? Well, pearls are clearly something precious. And swine, uh, it, in a Jewish community, pigs were people who, who uh, disparaged Judaism and the teachings of the Torah. And so Jesus said to the people in the Sermon on the Mount, don't throw your treasures where they're going to be trampled underfoot. He's teaching us something about the way we manage the things that are precious to us. Eugene Peterson, in his translation of this, uh, talks about uh, reducing the message to cheap slogans. And we need to be careful of that. We need to make sure that we bring the treasure that we have in the gospel to people in ways that are intelligible to them. I'll say more about this, of course, in the sermon in a few minutes' time. But now, let's listen to this reading by Christine from Matthew chapter 7 and pick out that phrase. Thank you, Christine. Um, just before I read, something that came to mind when Graham was mentioning the White Horse Fraternal, which, as you know, is meeting every fortnight through this crisis, a group of that fraternal, together with police in White Horse, are ensuring that nobody in White Horse who cannot get out to look after themselves is going without food. And I was incredibly touched, and I think you all know that despite my very obvious origins, I am always grateful to live in Australia, and never more than at this time of COVID-19. But I thought to be in a place where the police are engaged in social welfare. Now, I know this week there's been a few police who have not done the right thing, but we also saw a news clip about police going door to door to houses where they know that people, particularly women and children, are vulnerable. And this morning I had a text from a friend for whom Mother's Day, as for many of my friends, is a day tinged with sadness because she lost her only son. She has a beautiful daughter, but her only son died over 20 years ago now. But she was thinking about the families of the four policemen killed at the edge of the Eastern Freeway. And what a sad day this will be for so many people connected with them, especially their children and their spouses, and so many others. So um, I just wanted to say, I guess, thank God for good policing, and let's have big hearts for all those who are suffering. So now I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 12. It's the title of the first segment in this NIV is judging others. Do not judge or you too will be judged for in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. 
Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. The next section is Ask, Seek, Knock. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Thank you, Christine. So we come to our 14th study in the Sermon on the Mount, a series of reflections uh, when we decided to look again and look closely at some of the things that Jesus has to say to us. Well, the absence of sport, theatre, gyms, clubs, churches has driven those of us with internet to explore the media and the, what's available online in new and interesting ways. The creative genius of human beings is just amazing. It's been interesting to discover how, despite the need for social isolation and quarantine, choirs have sprung up, orchestras have played together, performances of various kinds have taken place as internet offerings. But not everybody has the internet. In our church, about a third are not online. One great internet-free activity is the jigsaw. And uh, I'm using a particular puzzle today to link what Jesus uh, says in the Sermon on the Mount. The Melbourne map. It's a jigsaw which is the brainchild of Melinda Clark, and who with a skilled and creative team produced initially a beautiful map of Melbourne, initially black and white and then upgraded to colour, and then eventually crowdfunded and turned into a jigsaw puzzle. And so this is so successful and so, uh, so indulged in, in this period of lockdown that the, in, the first edition is sold out completely and you can buy it now on back order but you have to wait for it to arrive in June sometime. Now in today's Bible reading you'll have noticed that Jesus gives guidelines for putting together the relationships that make up a Christian vision of life. You could think of it pretty disparately, different ideas, but you can see that relationships are the key, relationships with God, with other people and with God, with our Father in prayer as it were, and in our relationships and attitudes to others. These things come together as the reign of God in our lives, what Jesus calls the kingdom of God, what he invites us to put as top priority in our lives. Seek first his kingdom. He taught us to pray and we pray it each week here uh, and hopefully not just a form of words but as something we earnestly feel that God's kingdom would come and that his will would be done on earth. So with this idea of a jigsaw in mind and the idea of a city that can be made and be beautiful and livable, let us uh, pick up some pieces of what Jesus said. I've got them under the heading, locked down and putting the pieces together. And this is the uh, jigsaw puzzle. It's a thousand piece puzzle. I don't know if you, uh, if it arrives in June, you'll have time or patience to, uh, to uh, complete it before we're allowed to go back into all the places that we were in before. But let's think about lockdown, but putting the pieces together. That's our heading then. Firstly, the idea of judge. You're not the judge, says Jesus. Judge not. 
another saying we could have picked up on, or hypocrisy. No hypocrisy. This is seriously underscored by Jesus because it's something that we easily slip into. We become play actors, especially in front of cameras perhaps. Uh, be the brother or sister. I want to just underline that idea. It's a key idea in the passage. And then I want to pick up the idea that some things are sacred, that are in our ordinary lives. There is a sacredness. And we have to f nurture that and cherish it and value it. And then want to think about persisting in prayer. This is, this is hard. There are a whole lot of reasons. I'm tempted, uh, I won't do this, but I'm tempted to look at the reasons put forward by John Stott on this very point. Uh, his, his rich ideas about why people find prayer so difficult. And then finally, I want to remind you, it's the pieces that make the picture. Perhaps you know the frustration of getting to the end of the jigsaw pieces and discovering there's still a couple of holes in the picture. How frustrating that is. We need all the pieces to make the picture. Let's take this then, putting the pieces together. You're not the judge. This is uh, relating to the speck and the log that Jesus talks about. When Jesus say, judge not, that you be not judged, he's not opposing the judicial system. Some Christians have taken this to mean that. So they don't encourage people to go into the law or the judicial system. And Jesus is not meaning that. He's talking about personal relationships. And he doesn't mean that his disciples are not to form opinions, even critical opinions of others. There is such a thing as constructive criticism. In fact, a little later on, in uh, the reference to pigs, Jesus is asking us to make discrimination choices. So what does he mean when he says, judge not that you be not judged? Well, he's, he's uh, asking us not to condemn others, to give up the ambition, as it were, to be God, to imagine that we are the ones who have the power to put other people in their place. Finding fault and condemning others in our minds. So this is a command not to be blind, but to an encouragement to be generous. You're not the judge. Be generous in your assessment of others. What a good idea that is in terms of human relationships. There's a play I had to study at school. I only had a couple of Shakespeare plays to do at school. But this was one of them, The Merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that giveth and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mighty. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above the sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the heart of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth show likes God when mercy seasons justice. So Shakespeare picks up this idea of mercy. And so he's encouraging us not to be hypocritical, not to imagine that we can be in God's position. But we're used to referencing things to ourselves. We, we, we look at the world from, from our own perspective and we, we are, in a sense, geographically the center of our world. So we're often blind to our own faults. With a log in one's eye, we might imagine we can pick a speck out of somebody else's eye. First be aware of our own image. This is, uh, must have had a profound influence on Shakespeare because he, he wrote another play entirely about this idea, Measure for Measure, which is described as a comedy. It's a tragic comedy, really. But the whole play is uh, burst, based on verse 2. As disciples of God's kingdom, God has to be central in our lives and to assume his part as the ultimate hypocrisy. None of us can afford that. Avoid hypocrisy. 
How do we do this? How do we avoid acting God? We have to remember to be the brother or the sister that we are. The text says the other is the neighbor. Uh, in uh, uh, chapter 7 it says it talks about your brother's eye. In uh, some versions it talks about uh, your other people. It's, uh, she- uh, Eugene Peterson just uses the expression other people because it's that universal. Uh, and and the, the original word in the, in the, in the uh, Greek text is the word for a brother. So we need to rem- look at others as brothers and sisters. And we need to remember that. The actual word uh, for our neighbor is it should be important to us. A brother or a sister whom we respect. We're meant to serve and to love as ourselves. Jesus has said this already in the Sermon on the Mount. So the mercy of God to us has to be reflected in our relationships. We yearn for it. We want God to be merciful to us. We want the forgiveness of God. But do we mirror it in our relationships to others? Is it part of what we offer? If we're caught up in the whole new creation, the kingdom of God is bringing to us. If there's a new world emerging from the old, it's here. God is drawing people to his son and we need to live with that reality every day in every relationship. But some things are sacred. Indeed, it's the message about Jesus who is our treasure. He is our treasure. And the message about him enables us to reach out and to hold on to him by faith. We're familiar with the expression pearls before swine and I've referred to it already But Jesus' use of dogs and pigs is initially jarring. The terms were common in his day to describe non-Jews to whom Jesus' kingdom message, God reigns, would not be intelligible. And a little later on in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus sends out his 12 disciples on an initial mission in chapter 10, he tells them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not to the Gentiles beyond, They wouldn't be ready for it. It's not till after the resurrection that the uh, post-resurrection message, the treasure, something sacred and beautiful, is entrusted to earthen vessels and destined to spread all over the earth, to the ends of the earth. Matthew is emphatic about that as he records Jesus saying, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations and I am with you as you go. So the good news goes global, but there is a treasure here and we need to not reduce it to cheap slogans. We need to give it to people as we help them understand how it works into their lives and will enrich them. It is a blessing and we want them to experience that blessing and not to use it as a means of just continuing to ridicule people who do believe. And Jesus talks about persisting in prayer. Ask, seek, knock. These are the words that Christine pointed out. The reason God's giving depends on our asking is neither because he's ignorant until we inform him, nor because he's reluctant until we persuade him. The reason has to do with us, not him. The question is not whether he's ready to give, but whether we are ready to receive. So in prayer, we don't prevail on God, says John Stott, but rather we prevail on ourselves to submit to God. True, the language of prevailing, he says, is often used in regard to prayer, but it's an accommodation to human weakness. Even when Jacob prevailed on God, what really happened is that God prevailed over him, bringing him to the point of surrender when he was able to receive the blessing which God had all the time been longing to give him. The truth is that our Heavenly Father never spoils his children. He doesn't shower us with gifts whether we want them or not, whether we are ready or not. No, the contrary. Instead, he waits until we recognize our need and turn to him in humility. Tom Wright, commenting on these this encouragement to, 
to ask and to seek and to knock, says, it would be a shame to tone down one of the most sparkling and generous sets of promises anywhere in the whole Bible. The crux is that we have a Father with time, space and love for us. By prayer, we cooperate in piecing together the city of God. Jesus sums up the whole picture, the whole of the Old Testament law and the prophets with the golden rule. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Do for others what you would have them do for you. The key relationships with God as our Heavenly Father and fellow Christians as brothers and sisters through Jesus Christ provides an image of a jigsaw box of, of our lives. Let me take you somewhere else. After the destruction of Rome, the eternal city, in the year 410, St. Augustine wrote his great work. It's called The City of God. It was a defense of Christianity because it was being said that the emperor had become a Christian and allowed the empire, that was what had caused the empire to weaken. And so he said, no, the city of God is like this and the city of man is something else. So here we have a book with its vision of another kind of city which has profoundly influenced Western thought. It created a, a sense of history, the flow of history, and uh, a different vision of how life might be. It's provided a focused image for the idea of a jigsaw box. So in our coronavirus uh, crisis, provoked a lockdown and an opportunity to slow down in some respects and review what we're really asking and seeking and pursuing in our lives. Each one of us, like a puzzle piece, is in a right relationship to those around us and to our Heavenly Father. The full picture begins to emerge. and We will discover the beauty of St. Augustine's vision in the here and now, a love for others, mirroring the love which each of us have encountered in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we build our city, as we put the pieces of the puzzle together, let us create something beautiful in the here and now and make a contribution to the work that God is doing as each one of us plays our part. So may God bless us. In this lockdown, may we put the pieces together. May we have that global vision that the whole earth is to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God and our, our neighbours and our friends share in the joy of God's forgiveness and peace and purpose. Let us pray. A prayer drawing on Psalm 91 from Barnabas this month. O Lord, you are our refuge and our fortress, our God in whom we trust. Surely you will save us from the foulest stare and from the deadly pestilence. You will cover us with your feathers and under your wings we will find refuge. Thank you for the promise of your word that brings hope and comfort to all in danger, whether from violence or from virus, from persecution or from pain. Keep and protect all who suffer oppression and discrimination and all who are suffering from coronavirus or from its effect on jobs, income and daily life. We pray that as COVID-19 dominates our news, we will uh, find effective protection for all frontline workers whose daily routines provide a risk of infection that is real and potentially deadly. We remember them with gratitude and thankfulness. We pray that in the fight against this virus, you will encourage and give strength to teachers who have been adjusting to online teaching and now have to Learn how to gradually reintroduce classroom teaching. Help them with that task. We pray that all of us, including our political leaders, will remember lessons we've been learning while in necessary isolation and will carry the benefits into our future. Especially we ask you to help us play our part in piecing together the spiritual realities in the city of your design unfolded by Jesus. 
Thank you that some easing of restrictions has been deemed beneficial for the health and well-being of citizens and that across the country there can be a planned return to familial, friendly, creative and productive routines. We pray for those whom COVID-19 has brought illness, pain, impairment and bereavement. May they find comfort and help in their sorrow and find in the message of Jesus a peace that passes all understanding. We ask that you'll speak calm and reassurance to families feeling frustration, sadness and anger because of reduced circumstances and encourage those where working from home remains complicated by homeschooling and by the fear that normal may be very different from before. We pray that under-resourced poorer nations will be treated generously in terms of equipment and skilled personnel to assist COVID victims and also that they too will benefit from multi-layered and international research and development focused on vaccine and treatment. Remind us, Lord, once again to love one another as you have loved us. Shape us day by day into the people who seek a city whose builder and maker is God. May the Spirit of Christ reign in our hearts and our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and unite us as we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive again those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and upon those whom you love, and the whole church of God, now and always. Amen.